Thursday afternoon to you, 4 o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're having a good day. Talk a little Guardians and Cavs later in the show. We begin by talking Browns. Colin Coward on the Jerry Judy extension uh, that the Browns signed him to. This from the herd with Colin Coward. Jerry Judy was a great Bama receiver. Didn't do much in Denver. Cleveland paid him a contract, $41 million guaranteed and almost $60 million. And I was thinking about what's the most powerful thing in the NFL. The most powerful thing in the NFL is star quarterback. Number two is hope. That's why Cleveland paid this. There's nothing about his production. He's never had a thousand yard receiving that would give him almost $60 million. They're hoping that Kevin Stefanski and Deshaun Watson can somehow unlock Jerry Judy. He doesn't like blocking. He drops a lot of passes. And if he's not the number one receiver, he disappears. Yet there's hope that they can unlock a player whose best highlights are from college. A car loses half its value the second you drive it off the lot. And it's mostly the same with quarterbacks. Jaden Daniels now could fetch Bryce Young, fetched a couple of firsts, a couple of seconds, DJ Moore. You couldn't get a toasted bagel for him now. Hope not only springs eternal after the Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jacksons. It's the most powerful thing in this league. Jerry Judy has almost been a bust. And there's almost a shred of truth to everything that he says. <laughs> um, the way that, you know, I look at the extension, uh, Browns don't have any of their top receivers, so not Judy, not Moore, not uh, Cooper, under contract after this year. They clearly like Judy. They wanted him for two years. Um, in order to get a guy to sign a long-term contract, you got to give him some value. Otherwise, he's going to bet on himself. So the Browns are relying on their evaluation of Jerry Judy when they give him this contract. And if he performs like they expect him to, it's a bargain. Let's welcome in Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered uh, Browns Coverage. Your thoughts on the extension, Quincy? I feel like we're being, a lot of people are being like extremely arbitrary on this whole Jerry Judy thing. Like the whole he hasn't had a thousand yards is like, he had 976 in like 14 games in 2022. That's basically a thousand yard production. He's averaged about 14 yards per, per target. That's about on pace for what a thousand yard receiver would do his entire career. Um, the numbers haven't been explosive, but they've certainly been there. The production's been there. Um, and he was in what I think both sides would describe as a terrible situation. So, yeah, the Browns are betting on him. I find it hilarious that this Jerry Judy contract is worth a segment to Colin Coward. But Gabe Davis, who signed a very similar contract with very similar numbers that Jerry Judy has popped up, uh, you know, not worth the the whole uh, Hulk thing that he was throwing out there. So, yeah, I think the Browns, they're making a little bit of a bet. They like Jerry Judy. They feel like he was in a bad situation, and they feel like their situation can be much better for him simply because it's not Denver anymore, um, and they're willing to kind of put their money where their mouth is, and the Browns have done this with multiple players, and it's worked out for some of them. Some of them end up like the Jack Conklin contract, which doesn't didn't work out, not because Jack Conklin's bad, but because you just ended up with the Dwan Jones, and now you had Jack Conklin under contract. So, We'll see what they do. Um, and I like to remind everybody that contracts are evaluated at the end, not the beginning. Similar to draft picks, you can give a draft grade of an A plus the day of the draft. I'm pretty sure in 2014, we're giving that Browns draft an A plus. We got Justin Gilbert and we got Johnny Manziel. And what was we giving it by the end of the year? It's probably one of the worst NFL drafts of all time, especially when you look at the first round. Um, so the evaluation that matters is going to be in a couple of years with this contract, not you know, day two after it got signed. So I, I know you've uh, addressed this on your show. 2024, do or die for Deshaun Watson and Jerry Judy, do you think? Or, or how do you approach it? It's definitely like for the perception of Deshaun Watson and the perception of Jerry Judy, this is the season that they're going to be in position that if they overperform or if they perform to a high level, that it can change the perception on them, right? Right now, the perception of Deshaun Watson is negative. The same thing is true with Jerry Judy as we've seen the reaction to him 
signing a pretty bog standard wide receiver contract. So um, I think that this season, if they play well, they're going to have the opportunities to be on national TV. They're going to be playing meaningful winning football that it would change the perception. Outside of this year, you know, I think it's going to be set. Whatever people think of Deshaun is going to be what people think of Deshaun. Um, and if that's what they're at now, they'll they'll write the narratives as such. And the same thing would be true for Jerry Judy. What about um, Watson? What does it take for the Deshaun Watson trade to be successful, do you think? Oh, the Browns have to be Super Bowl contenders, right? I think that's what it boils down. So I know we like to make this about, oh, well, he needs to have this many yards and touchdowns, and I don't care if he has yards or touch. He had yards and touchdowns in 2020, but that team didn't really go anywhere with the Houston Texans. What you want with the Browns is to feel like, hey, this is a team that can get to the AFC Championship and be a legitimate contender. You want to feel like, they have a real chance to win the Super Bowl. We felt like this for a brief moment last year, right? When they beat the Ravens on the road at the coming back from 14, we felt to ourselves, hey, this is the kind of team that can win a championship if we could do that, right? Injured, Jeff Wills goes down during the game. Grant Delpit goes down during the game. Still able to win that game against one of the best teams in the AFC. You feel like you could do that. You can win the AFC. That's where they need to be. Now, do they have to get there to justify the trade? I tend to think not. You just have to be at a place where you think the Browns are a championship, a true championship contender, because that was the ceiling that they kept hitting their head against with Baker Mayfield was they would always be a fun team, but they can never cross over and be a championship contender. All right. Um, before we go to break, this is from ESPN.com. Did the Browns hit their free agency goals is the question. Other than trading for Judy, the Browns primarily focused on re-signing their core free agents. Browns are banking that Judy, a former first-round pick, still has number one wide receiver upside. Otherwise, Cleveland is basically running back the 2023 team. Well... Uh, to a to okay. a point, I, I, here's the thing. They're running it back with their top three tackles healthy, with their franchise quarterback healthy, and hopefully getting their franchise running back back. So if that constitutes running it back, I guess they're running it back then. Hey, you know who ran it back? The Kansas City Chiefs. They actually <laughs> ran it back with less, right? <laughs> If your team's good, your team's good. You don't need to go out here and make a million different splashes in free agency. I think we get caught up in that in, in March about the teams that are going to make the big moves. And some of them, you know, they, they sign these big name players. But let's be real. Are we going to be talking about the Raiders in February? No, we're not going to be talking about the Raiders in February, right? They made some big splash signings, but we know what that is, right? Um, they are going to be teams that get excitement during this period, but I think, honestly, it comes down to who has a good roster. And also, like, Dave, have we forgotten this whole idea of, like, hey, returning a lot of players is really good. Like, in college football, we understand this concept. Oh, this team has a ton of returning starters, and they got a lot of seniors, and, ooh, they're going to be good. But now it's like, oh, yeah, well, you didn't get three five stars from the transfer portal to start right away. I guess you're going to stink now, right? Um, no, the Browns have a lot of returning star players, guys coming back from injury as well, from a roster that was so good that they could win with four different quarterbacks, including a 39-year-old Joe Flacco, Good enough to get him back into the league, by the way. Like, shout out to Joe Flacco. Got an $8 million contract. Made a great decision to play with the Cleveland Browns. But this is a really good roster. The defense is really good. Yeah, they ran it back, I guess, if, if you want to put it like that. But if you're running back a really good roster, I think you're in a pretty good place, right? And, and they're counting on Jerry Judy to be a number two. I, again, Amari Cooper's a number one receiver. I, I, I don't understand why people don't want to give Amari Cooper credit for being a number one. He's a number one receiver. He just is. And they paid Jerry Judy like a number two receiver, right? Like $17 yeah. million is like a high-tier number two receiver, right? Right now, he's been a number two receiver. I think they're expecting him to make the jump to like a high-tier, like a thousand-yard one th uh, number two receiver. And then they'll probably, you know, either look to Coop or if Jerry Judy does explode, they might look to him as a number one. But, yeah, that money that they gave him is number two receiver money. Number one receiver money is usually like 23 to $28 million. Which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's good work if you can get it. Quincy Carrier and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out of the side of the break. We'll head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Sports for CLA. We'll be right back. Stay with us. All right, everybody. 
Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. It's like the $1 Lady Luck 5X. Because the pink really pops like my safety vest. Plus a $1,000 grand prize really ham is at home for me. And this $2 10X really nailed it for me. Two bucks for a shot at 10 grand? That's rock solid. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever with five price points from $1 to 20. They're built for fun. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE with Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage. Let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Why are the Browns not adding Kareem Hunt back to the lineup somewhere along the line? He always scores touchdowns. Number two, Shafrat and Wooten to the left, Mara in the middle, Hickerson and Clark to the right, Burr in tight. No team today or in the past could defeat that line. No team could defeat that line. Have a good day. As always, appreciate all the voicemails. Different game than it was back then. Uh, relative to Kareem Hunt, um, I, I think Browns have moved on. I think Kareem Hunt has kind of moved on. Uh, Quincy, your, just your thoughts? Yeah, I think they're going to move on from Kareem Hunt. Um, this is age, right? They feel like they can get a short yardage back for cheaper and a younger guy who has maybe more upside. Um, and while Kareem Hunt did solid in his role last year, remember Kareem Hunt was really only brought back to this team once it was made obvious that Nick Chubb would not be returning. Now that you have Nick Chubb back, that room's even more crowded. You just signed a running back this week on top of Naheem Hines, and you still have Jerome Ford. There's really just no room for Kareem Hunt in this running back room. Yeah, and I think it was pretty clear that he was going to explore free agency at the end of the last season. Um, the, the guy you're talking about is Dante Foreman. So, uh, Foreman, five total touchdowns for the Bears last year, all of which came in the red zone. He is kind of the guy that uh, the Browns look to to fulfill Kareem Hunt's role. Uh, Kareem Hunt was basically a, a, a short yardage, you know, bull type of back, and, and that's what they got Foreman for. A little bit younger. Foreman's 27, so he's a little bit younger than Hunt. Mm -hmm. And, like, he has a, a recent history of being pretty productive, almost had a 1,000 yards with the Carolina Panthers. You look at his recent history, he's been over 4.2 4 yards per carry, which is kind of where you want to see a running back be at. And Kareem Hunt, when he's been given those full carries, he hasn't been one of those 4.2 carry yards a guy. Yeah, there's an interesting stat with Foreman. Um in, in his NFL career, every game that he has gotten 16 or more carries, he's gotten at least 80 yards. So that, that's, mm. that's kind of the thought process. All right. Um, I know you've addressed this on your show as well. Biggest winners for the Browns in free agency. Yeah, I think Deshaun Watson and Ken Dorsey really got a lot of flexibility this year. Um, a lot more options with wide receiver, just bringing in another wide receiver who can play both inside, outside. We'll primarily play the slot, right? I think we're all kind of understanding that's where Jerry Judy likes to play. Um, and I think Elijah Moore likes to play on the outside. But I think it just puts guys into the right position. Um, it allows Ken Dorsey to do a lot of things with his wide receiver room. So if he wants to get creative with some formations, um, he can get creative. And I think it offers Deshaun Watson some flexibility. You know, you got three guys who are real deal route runners. There are going to be a lot of choice routes this year, right, which means they, they got to get that chemistry right. Hopefully Deshaun Watson can be thrown in the spring because I do think that's going to be important when you have a choice route heavy offense like the Browns are looking like they're going to be planning to do. But when you do have a choice route heavy offense, you want those really good route runners and you have three guys who are crisp, clean, um, you know, made for TV route runners. All right, let's flip it. Biggest losers uh, for the Browns in free agency as well then. Yeah, the Browns brought in Jameis Winston and Tyler Huntley when DTR in August was the backup quarterback. That's a concern, right? That is a concern. Me, somebody who was on the side of DTR during the season, that is a concern if you are a fan of DTR and you want to stay on the Cleveland Browns. Also, the offense changes. You know, it seems like they want to attack downfield a little bit more. It seems like they want to be more of a quick strike offense. That's not the strength of DTR. And part of me wonders 
is he not the mode of quarterback that they're really looking for anymore? And does that leave him as an odd man out in this situation? Because you look at Jameis and Deshaun, similar play style. You look at Jameis, Deshaun, and Tyler Huntley, they get there differently, but when they throw the ball, they have similar thought processes and how they like to go through it. And then you look at DTR, and he's completely different than all of these other guys, which tells me that I don't know if his plans are there's long-term plans anymore for DTR on the Cleveland Browns. And I know some people think that Tyler Huntley is a camp arm. Jeff Driscoll is a camp arm. Tyler Huntley is definitely not a camp arm. He's somebody who backed up like, well, did a good job of backing up one of the best quarterbacks in the league. And also one of the quarterbacks who missed the most games in the league. So like a very experienced quarter backup quarterback there so you know he's not here to be inactive on game days like he's going to be the third quarterback and I think that the question is well will they carry DTR will he be inactive will they carry four or are they going to try to trade him or are they going to try to sneak him onto the practice squad well I, I think one of those three um assuming Watson's healthy Winston um not so much Winston Huntley or DTR could end up being traded for a fourth or fifth round pick kind of Josh Dobbs if somebody comes calling late in camp it's an asset yeah. it's an asset for Andrew Barry well and Huntley signed a vet minimum so if he, he if somebody wanted a fifth round pick for him they would have signed him I would assume so I think really the only guy that you can see getting some trade value for is DTR because he still has three years left on that rookie deal um, a lot of upside and if you're an offense that is more of a strict west coast team kind of like how the patriots are going to be now or the denver broncos i could see them missing out on some of the guys they wanted in the draft and thinking to themselves well getting dtr is as good as getting like bo nicks in the fourth round right or or injury you know if somebody gets injured tyler huntley sitting there that's you know that's kind of they thought Kyler Murray was going to be ready until Kyler Murray wasn't ready, and then they traded for uh, Joshua Dobbs last year. All right, uh, what do you think we learned from the Browns during free agency? I think we learned that they are, one, really high on Jerry Judy, much higher than I think we anticipated. I think we knew they were high on Jerry Judy a couple of years ago. We didn't know to the extent they traded for him and signed him almost immediately. Um, you know, like think about somebody that they were high on, like Elijah Moore. They didn't go out and like extend Elijah Moore last year, right? After they traded for him, um, and they still haven't extended him. His contract set to end after this year. But so they're really high on Jerry Judy, and I think that they felt like they were pretty set on defense. Also, Siaki Ika don't really know if they're thrilled with the progress that he's made because if you look at this defensive tackle room you were thinking okay they're going to lose Jordan Elliott and that's where Siaki he can slide in that's how he gets game day active this year but they brought in Quentin Jefferson which makes me feel like there's really no room for Siaki Ika yet again and it's not like they they couldn't avoid that they went out of their way to make sure that they had four defensive tackles um, in free. Well, they brought in three, have Dalvin Tomlinson, and then you have Siaka Ika kind of out there again, kind of not without a position or, or a path to be active. So I would say that's what we learned about the Browns during the offseason. Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage and I going to step aside, take a quick time out. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about free agency, favorite signings, least favorite signings. Turn our attention a little bit to the draft. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Try C, where futures begin.
We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carey from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage. This one from Pro Football Focus. Favorite, least favorite free agent moves for all 32 NFL teams. Uh, for the Browns, favorite, Zadarius Smith signing. Two years, $23.5 million, $19 million guaranteed. Smith was a handful for opposing offensive lines in 2023. Perfect fit as a movable chess piece, Jim Schwartz defense. Don't let the dip in sack production fool you. Smith was still a menace up front. Least favorite, they say not applicable. We're not doing trades here. We loved the minor draft pick comp compensation it took to acquire Jerry Judy, but his reported extension appears quite strong for the player, even considering that the wide receiver market is going to explode this offseason. Um, I, I agree with Zadaria Smith. I We've already talked about the um, the – way people are viewing the extension of Jerry Judy. Again, people were going crazy when they paid, uh, they picked up Amari Cooper's $20 million contract. Looked like a bargain pretty quick. If Judy performs like they expect him to, it's going to be the same thing with that contract. Yeah, and I, I also think just the numbers on it aren't going to look crazy in a couple of years, right? Like, I think that also matters as well. Um, I think people kind of get locked into this because people have been negative about Jerry Judy, but his production hasn't been terrible. And it's like, which Jerry Judy are we talking about? Are we talking about the 800-yard wide receiver? Or are you talking about who you wanted him to be coming out to the draft? And I think a lot of that becomes irrelevant when you're talking about the Cleveland Browns because they're paying him to be a $17 million a year wide receiver. And a $17 million a year wide receiver is somebody who can get about 800 to 1,000 yards, which is what he's proven to be capable of in the NFL. Yeah, and, and it's relative to, you know, look at Jed Wills. Jed Wills is, is viewed around the NFL as an average left tackle. Browns fans are killing him because he followed Joe Thomas and he was the 10th pick in the draft. Jerry Judy was the 15th pick in the draft, so people are killing him because he doesn't have, you know, they're looking at what, you know, Justin Jefferson, who was taken after him, is doing. And, and that's one of the reasons Judy's getting beat up nationally. Yeah, and I think that matters for the Denver Broncos, right? If you Doesn't, draft somebody at 15, you're going to worry about who you had after that pick and what you could have done with it. But the Browns didn't draft Jerry Judy at 15. If Jerry Judy were taken at pick 24, it wouldn't change the fact that the Browns would have likely traded for him because they like him as a prospect. Um, and again, the contract is not for Jerry Judy to live up to his draft hype or whatever people thought of him coming out the draft. This is not a number one receiver contract, $17 million a year. It's not nothing. It's a strong number two contract, but it's definitively in that number two wide receiver range. Yeah, and keep in mind, the guarantees in it are $41 million. If it's up to the $57 million, he's probably – Browns are probably going to be happy because the incentives are probably right around that 900 to 1,000 yards. There's certain touchdown incentives. They're going to be achievable, but they aren't going to be, you know, layups, if you will, the incentives that would get it to that $57 million. Yeah, and I think, what, 15 of that um... – that the guaranteed money is from just his fifth year extension, his fifth year option that got picked up. So, like, really, we're talking about 26 million of it being guaranteed and new money. Um, but yeah, I, again, I, I'm, not, I'm fascinated by how much of a big deal this contract was. But I guess if you bring up the Cleveland Browns and you say the word contract, people are obligated to have an opinion about it, right? Like, it just is what it is. All right. Uh, the draft. Do you think it's a good draft for the Browns as they look at, at what they need and, and what areas are strong? In some parts, right? Like, I... I don't think it's a coincidence that this is a draft where they have five picks. I'll put it like that. Um, the You look at what Andrew Berry likes to draft. You look at the type of players he likes to draft. There's just not a ton in here, right? And I think that's going to be something that this front office is going to have to adjust to um, with NIL and the transfer portal and guys staying in college longer, um, which means the age, the average age of a draft prospect is pushed up, which means their target range is pushed down a little bit. So I don't, I wouldn't be surprised there. I think it's a strong draft for like the second, third, and fourth round. And I really wouldn't be surprised if they traded back to get more third and fourth round picks um, because right now they have one third and no fourth, 
if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong on that. You're, nope, um, that's right. So yep. I think they would want more in that range of picks. But outside of like, once you get to like pick 200, I don't think that there's really much that they want to do with there. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they sat at five, um, but trade it back at you know 54 or move back or maybe they like somebody at 54 this might not be a draft where the browns leave with like a bunch of players i don't think that's what they're going for this year yeah so you mentioned you know the fewer underclassmen people stand in school not as many it makes the fifth and sixth round pick that they traded for jerry judy even less valuable i mean a fifth and a sixth round pick are like eh. in this draft they're even less valuable. Yeah, and I know people are going to bring up the outliers, right? Oh, well, Tom Brady won the fifth or sixth round. Not this year. Like but, <laughs> yeah, well, it's like there might be one of those guys, but, like, banking on that happening is an insane bank to try to make, right? Like, um, you know, these fifth, sixth round picks, you're lucky if they make the roster. Um, and, I, and especially in a draft where you're not going to have that many players available for you. This is the smallest draft class, I think, in recent memory. Yep. It really does make sense to not have that many picks past 200. Yeah, there were half the underclassmen uh, as the year before declared. All right, um, this is Maurice Jones-Drew, a former NFL running back's top five running back prospects from this year's draft. This is from NFL Game Day. He likes Trey Benson, Florida State number one, Will Shipley from Clemson number two, Blake Corum from Michigan number three, Frank Gore Jr., NFL Bloodlines from Southern Mississippi, four, and Jalen Wright from Tennessee, number five. Um, I would, I still think the Browns will take a running back. You like any of those guys? I, I don't think they're going to take one in necessarily the third, maybe not even the fourth round. Uh, if, if the right one's there in the fourth, they may. Um, do you think any of those fit with what the Browns look are looking for? Yeah, I think they like Trey Benson. Um, I don't know. Like a lot of people go to Blake Corum. I don't know if that makes much sense or what the Browns want to do. Um, you know, he's kind of a smaller back and he's not like especially a great athlete. I think the Browns like those great athletes at the running back position. Um, I would say my same criticism would go with Frank Gore Jr., who a little bit more slight than you would expect somebody named Frank, Frank Gore Jr. to be. Jalen Wright, I haven't really gotten to see much out of, but of those names, I would go with Trey Benson. Is there, a, is there another running back you think makes more sense uh, for the Browns? I mean, we're talking about past 200. We're talking about like sixth, seventh round, like Dylan Laub. I think makes sense out of New Hampshire. Um, you know, receiving back, I think he could do some special team stuff for the team and kind of help you in some ancillary ways. Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage and I can step aside, take uh, one more time out, other side of the break, we'll kind of look at some of the things that um, other teams in the AFC North have done, see how the Browns stack up. Sports for CLE, be right back, stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as Academic All-Stars and Teachers of the Month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K-12. Is your K-12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carrier from Untitled, Unfiltered uh, Browns coverage. So Derrick Henry signed with the Ravens. He's had double-digit touchdowns, 10 or more, every year the last six years. Uh, near the goal line, defense are going to have to pay attention to him. That's going to make Lamar Jackson a real pain in the red zone for the Ravens. Quincy, I know you're not as concerned um, about Henry with the Ravens as I am. Why not? Yeah, I mean, what about that sounds different than what you have to deal with with Baltimore last year? 
it's just I think he's just better than Gus Edwards or he, he's more more of a well, hand in short yardage. He's about the same as Gus, right? His big thing has been his ability to get downhill and get those big gash runs. But, like, when we talk about his short yardage performance, he's always been a little bit more vulnerable than I think people, like, think of him. He's been easy to get there um, relative to other parts of the field. And, you know, Gus Edwards, one of the better short yardage backs, I think, in the NFL. Um, so I don't think he's that much different from Gus in those goal line situations. Yes, he can run the ball, and I think they're going to be able to run the ball well, but Baltimore's been able to run the ball well since 2018. I don't think that really changes the dynamic of who they are. It just kind of reinforces it, and I think this Baltimore team would be a lot more dangerous if they would have invested that money at wide receiver versus getting another running back who is going to be good, like he's probably going to get 800 to 900 yards, but also – He's past his prime. The older he gets, and what do you hear everybody say that plays in the NFL that has had to tackle Derrick Henry? They say guys like Nick Chubb are harder to tackle. Derrick Henry, if you get to him before he gets going downhill, you can he's easy to get, right? Like he's easier to get than people would think. The older he gets, the longer it's going to take him to get downhill, which means that window teams have to hit him. It's going to be wider. And we saw what happened with him in the tech, tech, Titans last year where the Browns' defensive line just dominated the game and then those linebackers were able to just shoot past them. And if you're a quick defense that can penetrate like most of these AFC North defenses are, then you're going to be able to get to him before he gets going. And the AFC South, much different beast than playing in the AFC North. I think all of that's kind of going to take its toll and take Derrick Henry from King Henry to, you know, Really good running back, Derrick Henry, which I think they Baltimore's had with Keaton Mitchell, um, you know, with, with J.K. Dobbins. And I'll be honest with you, Keaton Mitchell is the type of running back that kind of scares me if Baltimore has because he adds a completely different element of athleticism and, and side-to-side ability that they don't have currently. But right now, if you're a defensive coordinator against the Baltimore Ravens, them signing Derrick Henry doesn't really change how you – call up your game plan against them because you've been planning for that kind of attack from Baltimore. They just pretty much felt like they needed to upgrade over what Gus Edwards has. And in some ways he's going to be an upgrade to Gus, but in other ways he's not going to be the upgrade that I think people are anticipating because I think the perception of Derrick Henry is a short yardage back. is much different than the reality. And we kind of had the same thing with Nick Chubb where the perception of him as a short yardage back is not what people think. It, the other thing is the the Ravens, for whatever reason, last three four years haven't been able to keep a running back healthy. You think about it, Dobbins was hurt, and they, you know they were going third and fourth running backs. Um, and they lost a lot of offensive linemen this year, right? Like they they lost a lot of guys in the interior, a lot of guys on the outside. I, real questions about what they did this off season if they actually got better. How do you think the the Browns stack up with the AFC contenders right now then? I think they're in that class of teams. Like, there's three teams I'm like, okay, if they're healthy, they're contenders, right? Obviously, Kansas City. I think Baltimore, obviously Baltimore. They were in the AFC Championship game last year. They were the one seed. Um, They deserve to be back into that conversation. And a healthy Joe Burrow, Cincinnati Bengals are probably going to factor into that conversation as well. Then you have the teams that are trying to prove it, right? And I think Houston and Cleveland are the top two teams of that pack. I think the Browns have the best roster in the AFC. Um, They just have a bigger question mark at quarterback than Houston does. And that will be what kind of determines it. Does Deshaun Watson kind of play up to the level that we're expecting him to play? If he does, then the Browns will be a serious, serious contender for the AFC. All right, let's let's talk about Steelers. So they go out and they sign Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. How much more dangerous is their offense just by getting rid of Kenny Pickett and and having, I mean, their quarterback play went from here to at least here, and if Justin Fields gets going, maybe up here. When the Browns moved on from Johnny Manziel and Josh McCown (laughs) and then brought in Cody Kessler and Kevin Hogan, they did get better. It didn't matter. (laughs) So you you don't think it's it's not a noticeable improvement is what you're saying? Hey, well, when we moved on from Kelly Holcomb to sign Jeff Garcia, you did get better. Didn't matter. All right. Right. Like, I, I uh, hope you're not right. Not every upgrade at quarterback is clean. And also, I would question, like, hey, d- Russ could play better quarterback than Kenny Pickett, sure. But does having Russ in the baggage that it, ha- it yeah. means to have Russell Wilson 
take you out of playing Pittsburgh football? And does that actually make you a worse team? Right, because at least with Kenny, you can run the ball as much as you want, and you don't got to worry about anybody complaining about anything because it's Kenny Pickett, and don't nobody care what Kenny Pickett think. Russell Wilson, hey man, I've seen this before. It seems like ownership wants Russ. It seems like other parts of the team want Justin Fields. Hey, will we ever see one of those situations work out in Cleveland? There is Mike. Tom- right? There is the Mike Tomlin factor. Let's remember. Yeah. Where well, Mike Tomlin hasn't really been the guy to fix these issues the last few years now, has well, he, right? Like, we'll he's been able it. to get that team to be above 500. But when it comes to this kind of stuff, the, the locker room stuff, the quarterbacks getting along stuff, that that has not been what he has been successful no. with. So I, I would be – I don't think he's going to be a disaster this year. They're going to be good enough defensively. But, you know, they're, they're going to be a pretty entertaining mess. Uh, all right. Before I let you go, you look at the Browns roster. Uh, do you think it's better than last year? And are there areas you would still try to improve on it? Yeah, I think they are better than last year because they added a wide receiver on the offensive side of the ball. They pretty much brought back the same defense that was pretty good last year. Um, and now, you know, you, you have a better wide res- a better offense, a healthy offense, right? That's what you hope. And you should be a better football team than you were. Um, are there areas where they should look to upgrade? I mean, I think what they need to think about is just like, Offensive line for the future and maybe even for this year. Um, Jet Wills, I think, is a giant question mark. Uh, he had points of the year last year where he looked awful, and there were points of the year this year where, I mean, last year where he looked pretty damn good, like as good as he's ever looked. So um, I would want a little bit more insurance off that. I thought he struggled when he played those division opponents that were more familiar with him. Um, but other than that, like, I, I think that they're fine. Like, this is as good as a roster as you can build. Um, and Deshaun Watson said it on his podcast. I mean, this is a championship-level roster if they have a good quarterback. Yeah, they just, they, as he said, they have to go out and do it um, without question. And it starts with him getting healthy. Um, Quincy Carrier, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Quincy. Thank you. Quincy Carrier, make sure you check him out. Always really good Brown stuff. Untitled, unfiltered Browns coverage. Um, Always very insightful. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. So we turn our attention to the Cavaliers. Sam Amico from HoopsWire.com talking Cavs on Sports for CLE when we return. Go ahead and pop a clamp on that. Let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery, like this new $20 100X with its million-dollar grand prize, I want to get my cut of that 76% payout. So, good news. We're playing the largest family of scratch-offs ever. These Lady Lucks have all the fun and no complications. Sports for CLE continues. We turn our attention to the Cavaliers. Cavs lost to the Heat 107-104 last night. Haven't won back-to-back games since February 25th and 27th. Uh, Now they are missing four guys from their normal rotation. Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, Max Struess, Dean Wade. Uh, Let's welcome in Sam Miko from HoopsWire.com. Sam, what what have you seen with the Cavs the last month or so? I, I mean, it's... It, I know it's hard when when you've got all those guys kind of rotating in and out, but they, they got to get they got to get things rolling. There's only 13 games left in the regular season. Yeah, and only five of those are at home. So you know you want to try and take advantage of your games that you have at home, which of course they didn't do against Miami, uh, a Miami team that was also extremely shorthanded without. Uh, Without Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero, old friend Kevin Love didn't play, Josh Richardson. You know, so uh, the Cavs, of course, without their usuals, Donovan Mitchell and Max Struess and Evan Mobley and top backup Dean Wade. So, um, you know, it seems like the goal right now with 13 games left is really just try to survive and keep forming, you know, what they call, what the coaches will always call good habits while you're uh, 
going through this phase without so many of your guys and hope that you can get everybody healthy for the playoffs. But it's been, you know, since the all-star break because of the injuries, uh, very, very uneven uh, play. And, 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 you know, some of that's out of their control. Um, we mentioned 13 games left in the regular season. Is it – are they just hoping to get everybody back for the playoffs or are they hoping to get guys back, you know, the week before so they can get some semblance of, of what a playoff rotation might look like? Or is that dreaming at this point? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think that they're hoping to get, you know – Ideally, you would like all your guys back before the playoffs uh, simply because, you know, it's going to take you a couple games, I would think, to get everybody kind of readjusted. You don't want to throw Donovan Mitchell, Max Struess, Dean Wade, and Evan Mobley all in for your first playoff game because, you know, then it's everything has changed at the most important time of the year, the most important game of the season. So I suspect, you know, J.B. Bickerstaff said on Wednesday night that – uh, the three, Mobley and Struess and, and Wade, are progressing. They had some good on-court work earlier this week, so they're getting back on the floor. He didn't give a timeline as to when they may be back, but it sounds like they will be back, barring any further setbacks, uh, before the end of the regular season. Probably, I would suspect, within the ne next week or so. And That's just a guess, but that's what it's sounding like. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, you know, he's been struggling with this knee thing. Now he's got, uh, you know, he had to undergo a procedure on his nose, uh, the victim of friendly fire from Tristan Thompson in that Rockets game. So he's going to miss at least three or four more games. Um, and I, I obviously he's the key. He's the one guy that you definitely need back before the playoffs. So, uh, you know, just a lot of, waiting and wondering and, and trying to survive uh, while those guys are missing. So they signed Marcus Morris to a 10-day uh, contract, came out and, and hit a bunch of threes in his first game. Um, is he a guy that you, you could see them signing for the rest of the year and then maybe even getting some minutes in a, in a playoff rotation type? Absolutely. I mean, he did. He came out. <clears throat> you know, that's the nice thing is that the Cavs went on a three-game trip and, and won two of them against two teams that are playoff teams. They won at New Orleans pretty convincingly, and then they came back and beat Indiana at Indiana, and that was an impressive win. And as you said, Dave, Marcus Morris had four threes uh, in that game in the first three quarters as a Cav. He had 12 points. He finished with 14. So, um, yeah, I mean, they like the fact that he's scrappy. He can hit threes. He's a veteran guy who's been around. Uh, and those are the kind of guys that can really help you in the playoffs. So I think that they're using this as kind of an audition for him. And so far, he's, you know, two games, he's delivered. He's looked like the type of guy that you would want coming off the bench in the playoffs. So, uh, yeah, I think that even with Mobley back and Wade back, I mean, those guys play the same spot as Morris. I don't think, and obviously George and Yang, all those guys are a little bit repetitive. But in today's NBA, you know, it's become so positionless that you could play two or three of those guys at the same time. So, yeah, I, I suspect that if this continues, he's on a 10-day contract. Maybe they sign him for the rest of the year at the end of one and then, you know, have, a, have another veteran guy who can come in and help uh, during the playoffs. So uh, this is from the Bleach Report. Goals for every NBA team down the stretch. For the Cavs, lock up a top three playoff seed. Grabbing second place's idea it ensures home court advantage through at least the conference semifinals. Anything Cleveland can do to postpone a potential matchup with the Celtics as long as possible is gargantuan when they're this banged up. You could say that for anybody in the East. Anything anybody in the East can do to delay a matchup with the Celtics is what you want to do. So currently in the third, um, they would be the third seed, a game behind the Bucks, game and a half ahead of the Knicks. Um, I get it. Top three is absolutely what you want to do because that means you don't face the Celtics until the conference finals. Right, and that's a, that's a big deal. And I think, it, you know, Three or two isn't quite as important 
uh, as as trying to stay out of that four spot for the reason you just mentioned. Boston's going to finish with the number one seed. So if you finish fourth, you know, you and you and you get out of the first round, well, then you get the Boston Celtics. Not that the Milwaukee Bucks are any picnic or prize, but uh, you would think that that would be a, a better situation for you. Plus, you know, you're looking at these teams now that are in the six seven range. That's not going to be a cakewalk either because the Miami Heat are down there, who I don't think the Cavs want to face in the first round. They beat Milwaukee out last year. Let Milwaukee play them again. And then you talk about, you know, the Philadelphia 76ers, who are in that range as well, uh, could be a number seven seed but have Joel Embiid back. So, you know, there might be a benefit to finishing third as opposed to second because third, you might be able to get somebody like the – uh, Orlando Magic young playoff team, you know, haven't been in the playoffs in five years, a, a, or the Indiana Pacers. So, you know, one of those teams could finish sixth. That's what you're hoping for is a matchup with one of those two if you're taking your pick or somebody like Chicago or Atlanta who comes out of the play-in tournament. So, you know, it's it's for the Cavs, Bleacher Report is correct. Two or three is ideal. Four, you probably are going to be facing a much better opponent Somebody like could be Miami, could be the Knicks, just depending on how things transpire from here. So, yeah, theoretically, top three is is where you want to be. And I suspect that the Cavs are going to play well enough to at least hold on to that number three spot because, Dave, they're they're not playing great. and They're only a spot behind the Bucks right now. Yeah, and, and, you know, the flip side of it is um, if you're the two, you get home court. You know, that's, that's obviously the – and you're within a game of the Bucs, um, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, same thing, Bleacher Report, nightmare matchups for projected NBA playoff teams. Uh, Cavs, na- nightmare matchup, they go with the Knicks. Season record one and two, if Cleveland gets knocked – out by the Celtics or Bucks, it can still be deemed a successful season. If the Knicks are the culprit, it's going to be a long, painful offseason for the Cavs once again. Um, yeah, that's probably true. Um, they don't match up well with the Knicks. They just don't. No, the Knicks play a playoff style of basketball most of the season. Uh, they're just, you know, not too many teams are going to match up great with the Knicks in the playoffs because of the style of play. Uh, they, they added OG and you know, if he's healthy, uh, that's another defensive player that they have. Julius Randall comes back, uh, from his shoulder injury, which he's expected to do. I mean, they, they're just, they're a team and Jalen Brunson, obviously could, you know, you can make a case for him as the best point guard in the Eastern conference, one of the top four or five in the entire league. So they're, they, the Cavs have a struggle with them in particular, um, you know, you'd almost would rather would rather they play somebody like Miami in the first round. The Cavs have won two games this year, uh, even though they lost to Miami at home. They won, they won uh, a game against the Heat in Miami. So, uh, you know, it's just the Knicks are just. You're right; they're a tough matchup. And as far as the Cavs go, yeah, I mean, no matter who you play, I think you really need to get out of the first round this year. This is the year you're going to have home court advantage again. So, you, you know, you, you need to take advantage of it. Yeah, and, and again, you, you win a playoff series, you push somebody in the second round, and, and you can see the progress building forward, and that's, that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, but, but I'm with you. If it's, if it's another home court first-round exit, it's, that's not what you're looking for if you're the Cavs. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of talk about what a great season it's been, and it really has been. They're better this year than they were last year, without question. Even with, you know, missing Mitchell for so many games, they missed Mobley for so many games already with the knee injury and now the ankle thing. Uh, they missed Garland for a month with a broken jaw, and yet they were able to overcome all this. They've been able to sustain success and be even better than last season and be in the race for the top two in the conference and win the central division. They're a game behind Milwaukee in spite of all this. Uh, so, you know, all that's well and good. That's so all I hear from fans when I'm, you know, tweeting out stuff or posting to Facebook or whatever is, are they going to get out of the first round of the playoffs? And that's where success is, you know, measured. You, you do it. Uh, in the regular season, but you also take that next natural progression. 
I think most fans in the organization would probably be content if they at least get to the second round and put on a good showing. But if you don't do that, then yeah, there's, you know, that could lead to changes and all that stuff. So I, I, I think that they, you know, they're expecting to get out of the first round, the players, the organization. And if they don't, it'll be a disappointment for sure. Sam Amico, HoopsWire.com, as always. Uh, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Sam. All right, Dave. Thanks for having me. We will uh, talk to you soon. Sounds good. Sam Miko, make sure you check him out. Really good stuff, uh, not only with the Cavs, but the entire NBA, hoopswire.com. We're step aside, take a quick time out. So we talk Guardians baseball opener a week from tonight. Paul Hoynes, Guardians beat reporter for PlainDealerCleveland.com. Straight ahead. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. Sports for CLE continues to return our attention to the Cleveland Guardians. They will open the season next Thursday, a week away in Oakland against the Athletics. Um, let's welcome in Paul Hoynes, Guardians beat reporter for PlainDealerCleveland.com. So, Hoynesy, um, since last we talked to you, Shane Bieber will in fact be the opening day starter. It'll be the fifth time he's been the opening day starter. Only Feller and Kovaleski have started more games uh, for Cleveland uh, than Shane Bieber. Uh, what have you seen from him this spring? Oh, he's been great. Uh, he's had a great spring. Uh, pitched very, very well. He looks like a looks like a totally different guy. Um, you know, he's been aggressive. His velo's up. Um, he's starting to throw a change up, which he never did before. Well, he r rarely did before. But you know, the work he did at drive line in uh, the off season in Scottsdale, it's really helped him. And not only has his velo up, you know, uh, gone up, but it's helped his other pitches as well. So uh, it sounds like he's the Shane Bieber that uh, Guardians fans have come to love um, before, you know, the the setbacks the last couple of years with injuries. All right, uh, Gavin Williams probably going to start the season on the injured list. Um, I know you wrote an article about the pitching questions for the Guardians. Take us through that. Yeah, you know, he, he's got a, uh, you know, kind of felt a tweak in his elbow, and he was pitching great. He had two great starts, like nine strikeouts in about four, four or five innings. Uh, he's very, looking very good, but it, he's going to open on the IL, so they've got to find a fifth starter. Right now, it's uh, Carlos Carrasco, Tyler uh, Beatty, a couple other guys, Xavier Curry and Ben Lively were in the mix too, but they've been – like a virus, a viral, a viral infection has invaded the clubhouse. And I mean, people are falling left and right. It sounds like so. Uh, you know, I think those two have been struck pretty pretty hard by it. And I don't know if they're in the running for that spot yet. Yeah. So the guys you mentioned, you know, Carrasco, Beatty, Lively, all have major league experience. So it, it, they do have that. Um, but yeah, they, they, they kind of got to work through that. Who have been some of the Guardians that have been impressive in spring training? Some some folks that have opened eyes. Oh, you know, I think uh, it's a couple of the relievers. Uh, uh, Hunter Gaddis, you know, we saw him a bunch last year, but he has really had a good spring. Uh, Tim Heron, a 6'6", 6'7", lefty, who was up and down five times last year. You know, he, he really looks a lot more confident. Uh, I think, he, you know, Gaddis and Heron are probably going to take two of those open spots in the bullpen. I would think, uh, you know, and Cade Smith, uh, kid from Canada, big – tall, you know, strong, you know, throws really hard. Um, I think he's he's in line to uh, fill one of those, one of the four openings in the pen as well. Offensively, you know, uh, it's all about Chase Lauder. That's that's what this spring training is a bit about. No, we'll talk about him in a minute. Um, I, I know you wrote an article. The starting shortstop position is up for grabs. Um yeah, what do you think about that? What you wrote an article about? It. Take us through what uh, what's going on at short. 
Yeah, the main uh, competitors since day one of camp have been Gabriel Arias and Brian Rocchio. Uh, you know, I thought going in that the job was Arias's, you know, because basically they handed him the job after they traded Ahmed Rosario at the, at the deadline last year. But uh, it was like, you know, they, they held a competition and no one showed up <laughs> for most of the spring training. And uh, Rocchio has finally started to swing the bat the last five, six, seven games. And I, I think he's going to win the job because Arias, you know, not only did he catch the uh, virus, but he hasn't done anything, Joe. He just, I mean, he, I mean, he just hasn't swung the bat. Yeah, and it's going to be a, a club that needs offense from every position um, just because of the way it's going. I, I, all right, Chase DeLauder, first-round pick 2022 out of James Madison. Four home runs and 25 at-bats, 10 runs batted in, 520 average. Um, this is not an organization that uh, puts guys like that on the big league roster, everybody's every all the fans are clamoring. I'm sure you're getting. I, if I'm getting emails, I imagine you're getting emails. I don't see any way um, that Chase DeLauder starts the season on the big league team, even though he's hitting the heck out of the ball. No, he's had a great spring. It's been a great story, um, but you, you know, your heart says yes, but your, your you know your mind, your your practical uh, baseball knowledge says no, and I think. This would work for just about any organization. You know, this is a guy that hasn't really played a year in the minors. He, you know, he had a foot surgery last spring, um, didn't start playing, you know, in the Arizona, at the Arizona Complex League until June, really didn't get to double A until the end of the year. So, you know, he needs time. And, uh, you know, that's the big difference between baseball and other sports. You just don't roll off the, uh, you know, roll out of college and uh, go to the big leagues. I mean, unless you're Dave Winfield or somebody like that. Yeah, and again, uh, he hasn't played above double-A. He did well in the Arizona Fall League, but it, it's about progressions. And they're going to, it, when they send him down, they're going to tell him, we want you to work on X, Y, and Z. That's that's just the way they do it here, and, and it usually works out pretty well. Yeah, and I think you've got to, you know, what, what Terry Francona used to say is, you know, there's a difference between developing a player at the big leagues, a young player at the big leagues, and getting them beat up at the big leagues. And the last thing you want a guy like uh, DeLauder to go through is to come up in Cleveland, you know, all the, uh, the, 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 the spotlight is on you, and then, you know, you go 0 for 30 or 0 for 40 or, you know, you go 1 for 25 and, and you're struggling. And, you know, that's not helping him. And especially if then he's got to get sent down because if you if you bring a kid like that up, he's got to play every day. You're, you're not doing him any favors if you're just – if he's riding a bench. Yeah, especially April in Cleveland. Not going to be great weather. You, you want to make sure he's getting his at-bats. All right, um, before I let you go, who – who are some guys that are going to have to, to hit if this Guardians team is going to compete in, in the Central Division? We know um, they need offense. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's built around Jose Ramirez and, and Josh Naylor. Those two guys are, are, you know, you expect them to hit. They hit last year. They've hit throughout their careers. But Bo Naylor has to hit. He has to step up. This is his first big year first full year in the big leagues at catcher. You know, he's got a lot on his plate, but they need his power. They need a, a lot of a work out. I mean, they need a lot of production out of right field or, you know, uh, Ramon uh, Laureano, Will Brennan have both looked good in spring. Miles Straw is hitting close to 400 in spring training. So they need some work out of, you know, they need some production out of, uh, out of center field. Uh, they've got to, you know, I don't know if whoever wins the shortstop job, I don't know if uh, they'll get much pop out of that. But uh, Andres Jimenez has to play closer to uh, the Andres Jimenez from two years ago than last year at second base. He's he's the best defender in, in the American League. 
but he's got to swing the bat a little better. A um, couple of young guys, De La Santos, Rule 5 guy, Davison De La Santos, um, the Rule 5 guy. So I'm assuming, unless they're going to send him back, he, he will be on, um, on the big league roster. They, they either have to send him back to the Diamondbacks, make a trade, um, or he has to be on the big league roster. And then the other guy is Floreal, um, the, the guy they traded Cody Morris for. What do you think of those two? Are they, gonna, are they going to get some at-bats? Yeah, De Los Santos, a Rule 5 guy, like you said, um, you know, is really, uh, you, know, it's, you know, they knew what they were getting into when they drafted him. He's 20 years old. He hit 20 home runs, you know, at Double A last year. They knew they were going to have to keep him or send him back. So I think, you know, they're kind of committed to him and to just see what he can do. You know, they'll start the season in the, in the big leagues and just kind of go with it. Um, you know, uh, Florial has, you know uh, – he has not played real well. I mean, uh, he hasn't hit, um, but, you know, they, they kind of made a commitment to him as well. He's out of options. You know, they knew he was out of options when they traded for him. Uh, so, it, you know, it comes down to just how much they believe in him. Uh, do they do they base, you know, do they, do they cut him loose based on a bad spring or do you bring this guy in and try to upgrade the center field position? He did hit 28 home runs at AAA last year. And, again, those are all things that they'll have to work through. Um, we'll find out because the season starts a, a week from uh, tonight out in Oakland. Uh, Paul Hoynes, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Paul Hoynes, make sure you check him out. Really good Guardians coverage, Plain Dealer, as well as Cleveland.com. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE.